when I was at the Ravens, and I don't know if Ray will remember this, we're in a meeting room and Ray's asking all these other linebackers and here we're all trying to beat Ray out. And this is in 1997. And he's saying, hey, what are you seeing? And he's telling these people how to get better. And I thought it was really amazing. And I come from the Naval Academy, so we just kind of had that next man up mentality by, by doctrine and definition and demonstration. And uh, he got to me and I said, hey, Ray, why are you telling everybody your secrets? And he looked at me and he smiled and he goes, Clint, everybody gets the ring or nobody gets the ring. Mm. And then he smiled at me and he goes, and I'm not scared. And so those two awarenesses, one, I'm doing something so hard that I need 10 other people to be able to do it with me. And two, fear is the only reason you don't tell everybody the secret. Hi, I'm Eric Corum, and this is The Blueprint. I've spent my life helping Olympic gold medalists, NFL, and NCAA athletes be the best at their craft. Now I'm taking that experience and translating it into your life. This podcast is for busy professionals and household CEOs who care deeply about their family, career, and their health. There's an ocean of content to wade through, but I do the heavy lifting for you and distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your lifestyle and goals. Clint Bruce is a former Navy Special Warfare Officer and a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy where he was a decorated athlete. He was a four-time letter winner, captain of the football team, where he was named to multiple all-star teams. Clint had a brief stint in the NFL before leaving to become a Navy SEAL. As a naval officer, he deployed with three platoons during the global war on terror. Since leaving the Navy, he's founded two companies and a foundation. Clint is dedicated to helping leaders protect, perform, endure, and compete while helping veterans and their families transition successfully from service. In this episode, we discuss how to pursue being elite by using Clint's model for reloading. Clint also unpacks the five pursuits of a high performer and the difference between being elite and being an elitist. Clint put on a masterclass today for anyone wanting to live a life of purpose. Before we get into my interview with Clint, I want to let you in on something really cool that I'm building. If you love to exercise, but you aren't sure how hard or how long you should exercise each day, then you should check out my free app, AIM7. We have this cool feature where we provide you with custom exercise recommendations based on your current state of adaptability, or simply put, how much exercise you can adapt to that day. We do this by combining your wearable technology data with our decades of high performance expertise. The great thing is this is already layered on top of the exercise programs that you already love to do. So whether you love Peloton, Apple Fitness Plus, or your favorite hit program at your local gym, our recommendations work with what you enjoy doing. So if you have a wearable device like an Apple Watch, Whoop, or Aura Ring, then go to www.aim7.com. That's A-I-M-7.com to get early and free access to our exclusive program. AIM7 starts small and starts with you. Your health data your values to get to your thriving life. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Clint, thank you for joining me today, man. It's it's great to have you on again. It's awesome to be with you. Again. I've I've enjoyed your your podcast and listened to some of the other guests. And and I can say with confidence I've understood at least 60% of the words that people use on your <laughs> podcast. Is you have some smart people and y'all say smart people things. And so I'm like going to the the thesaurus and the dictionaries like oh, you know so but then i'll use it at lunch the next day like like i knew, always like it's like mike tyson's favorite word i just wove it into everything <laughs> i'm going to the pit and to bolivia oblivion i'm like do you mean bolivia or oblivion which one do you mean and so i, I weave these words in every conversation afterwards my wife can always be like do you listen to one of eric's podcasts i'm like yeah i did clint you're so full of it you're a Navy Academy, Naval Academy grad. Like you don't get in there unless you're pretty well. I mean, there was upstairs. a reduction in force, and we had mud stomped Iraq in like 36 minutes in the early 90s. So, so I mean, it is like listen. That's a great thing about being from the Naval Academy is no one asks you grade point average. It's not like they don't ask. But it, do and go, man. That's the way it is. So, well. The, it, to the people listening, it's such baloney because you are one of the best people with words that I've ever been around. Um, and I want to talk today about something that I think is really, really timely, actually, yeah. that we're going through this thing called the Great Resignation. 
Yeah. And a lot of people were like, hey, when COVID happened, all of a sudden they didn't go into work like they used to. They're at home and they started having this opportunity to reevaluate their lives. Yeah. And one of the things that you've talked about and your life has been about is pursuing elite. Can you yeah. talk about this continuum that you've discussed before? Yeah, man, I'd, I'd love to. Um, you know, I think introspection, not isolation. And, and there's a difference between introspection and isolation. And I think, I think understanding that difference is really, really important. Because isolation is, is, is the point past which you've extracted value out of introspection, right? Um, but I think introspection lends itself to kind of this reconciliation effort. Like, who did I say I was going to be and how close or far am I from those things? And I've always been, I mean, you know, I look at the questions I get asked often. And one of the questions I get asked really most often is like, what's your favorite gun? And I pause people <laughs> and I go, hey, are you asking me what my favorite gun is or what my favorite weapon is? And they'll go, it's the same thing. I'm like, it's not the same thing at all. Like a gun is a tool. A weapon is what I use to win. And my favorite weapon is a map. Because if I got a map, I've got everything. I know where you'll hide. I know where I'll come in. I know what 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 what, what guns will work and what guns won't work. And I've always kind of looked at life as like a series of, of of tethered maps to each other. And the way I describe it now is, it, it, for me, there's really four maps that matter most. There's the ball field, the battlefield, the boardroom, and the breakfast table. And for seasons of my life, the ball field and the battlefield were literal places. Hmm. But now they mean to me what they mean to anybody else. And the, and the ball field is take care of myself mentally and physically. The battlefield is protect those whom God has entrusted to me. The boardroom is provide for those whom God has entrusted to me. And the breakfast table is be a part of a family that loves me and that matters to others. And, 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 and why I love maps so much is because if you have a map, the worst you'll ever be is wrong but you won't be lost mm. and lost is awful. I mean, I've been wrong and lost and I hate them both, but I'll take wrong over lost any day. So as we kind of wind this back to this concept of pursuing a lead, I kind of came to the conclusion pretty early that there wasn't some X on a map where everything was going to be wonderful. Uh, and, and I would have no more questions about myself in the world, right? On any one of these maps. And what I realize is life is a series of adventures from one X to the other. Like I'm, I'm a child of, of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Hobbit. Like every great book I read when I was growing up, you open up and there's a map. And, mm. and, and what's interesting is on those maps and those great books is there's never one X. It's XX. And you just kind of, you're, you're kind of like this adventuring deal. <clears throat> and, and so for me, I've always kind of, had this kind of ridge line type appetite for life where you just kind of pick this ridge line and you get to it. And, and when you get there, you, you, you hug and you high five and you celebrate and, and you rest and you recover and you revel and we should do those things. But then you got to pick it. You, you really kind of got a choice of that. You can go back from where you came. You can stay where you are, or you can pick some miscovered ridge line and just go, let's go there. Right. And so for me, pursuing a lead is this kind of this concept of going, hey, what am I willing to accept for myself and others on the maps that matter most to me as far as outcomes go? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, a, I'm a simple guy. Right. I, I try to keep things relatively simple. So so for me, I, I, I maybe have a different concept on leadership than other people do. For me, leading is a verb. So if you're leading, you're a leader. You know, if you're swimming, you're a swimmer. If you're diving, you're a diver. If you're driving, you're a driver. We're defined by our actions. And if you're leading, you're by definition of leader. And I define leading as being looked to in a particular moment to make a decision or perform an action based on your unique gifts and abilities. So, so by that definition, everybody's a leader, right? I mean, everybody's a leader. All rank and roll really describe is how many people are hoping you get it right when it's your turn to wear the weight. Like, what is your turn to wear the light? What is the, what was the population of people that are hoping you get it right? And um, <clears throat> so for me, uh, I, I love looking at outcomes, not because outcomes are fatalistic or prophetic. They're just waypoints, you know, and an outcome, when you measure a past effort, an outcome tells you whether to push, pause, or pivot. Hey, did it work? Do we keep going? 
hey, hey, do we hold what we got, figure out what's going on and figure out what to do next? Or do we never, ever, ever try that again? Like that, that just, that just did not work. Right. I think that's so a good you, thing to identify sometimes. Like I ain't going back there. That's not, I'm not doing that one. I have a <laughs> lot of those. I, I know a lot of what not to do. And, and, and I tell young guys, I said, Hey man, production is progress. And for some reason we don't acknowledge that as progress, but knowing what not to do is tremendous progress. I mean, you're eliminating huge swaths on this map that you said was important. So to bring it back to pursuing elite for me, when I'm looking on the ball field, the battle for the board and the breakfast table, and I go, hey, what was that? Was that bad? Was that average? Was that good? Was that excellent? Or was that elite? And the difference between excellent and elite for me is the difference of being done or not done yet. Mm. Like for me, excellence is quantifiable. It's real. It's an X on a map. And elite is this mythical ridge line that's just a little bit further than what you thought you could do yesterday, right? And it's kind of like this subtle gravitational pull to the next ridge line that, that allows you to know that you're stewarding your time. And, 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 and so that from there, that's what pursuing the lead is pursuing the lead is, and it's not, this is not about marginalizing success in the least. Um, you know, what's been really interesting is I've visited with people over this last year and a half is, you know, I talk about the difference between being an excellent lead is the difference of and be, the, the ability to reload instead of relax. Right. Okay. And, What's that mean? And, they go, and, and that's, that's what it is like, what, hey, I, I, how do you reload? And I, and I thought about that for the first time because what I realized I was doing is I was, I was treading very closely to uh, sounding like I was advocating like this never be done. It's always the next thing. And that's not really what I mean. What I mean is being obsessed with the adventure hmm. and putting the outcome of that adventure in its rightful place as reconciled about where the real value proposition is which is the venture. Right? That's mm. where you learn. Right. And so for me, um, I actually wrote this down and I was speaking to a really big company and we were talking about this. I'd given pursuing elite to him several times. And what I'll do is I'll take these pursuit points, which we'll talk about in a minute and they have their own kind of presentations associated with them. Right. So, uh, but they go, Hey, Clint, you, you say we got to reload, but how do you reload? And I said, that's a, that's a great question. Let me, let me go back and look at my kind of notes. And I'm, I try to journal a lot, um, mostly because I can't remember what I did. So I can go back and look at the notes. <laughs> what I did, but how did I not die that time? And, um, but, but, but I'm not a very talented person. So I, I've got to, I tell people like my gift is not being gifted is I got to figure out the system. Like I was the fifth string fullback in eighth grade in Brandenburg middle school. That's pretty like hard. Their full, yeah. They're th- especially because they're only three of their fullbacks. Like it's <laughs> the whole position on the depth chart. And so I had to figure out pretty early why I played the game. Like I wasn't going to play the game because I was going to be famous. I'd have fallen in love with playing the game because of the camaraderie and the brotherhood and the lessons I learned from my coaches and, and what I learned about myself through adversity. And, uh, and, and, and one of the things I, I noticed is as I, as I became a good football player, um, and then when you're a captain or all these other things, like you have to, you have to figure things out really quickly. Like you got to learn how to reload really quickly. Like whether you won or lost, that next team's coming. And then next team is hoping you haven't figured it out. Right. That next team is hoping that you're carrying the victory too far with you or you're, you're marinating in defeat too far with you. And so you got to create a transaction, a process that allows you to reload. And what I realized is, and I use the context of Hell Week for this. Like when you, you know, Hell Week's a pretty famous thing, and, and, and most people know about it from the special operations community. And, and every unit has that. You know, the Marine Corps has a uh, uh, the Crucible, and, and you know, you 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 got the Rangers and selection and PJs. I mean, we all have our mm-hmm. kind of moment that 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 Crucible event. And but I tell people it's like you have never seen a more anticlimactic event than guys getting secured from Hell Week. It is just like, there's no high fives. There's no hug. There's like secure from hell. You're like, oh, good. Like, I'm so freaking tired, man. Like, that was so long. Like, you sure that? That felt like longer than. Don't they give days, you a right? t shirt with your name on uh, it? Yeah. Well, no, you just get a brown shirt. Like, yeah, brown just, shirt. It's your t shirt. You, yeah. you, you put your name on it. It's, yeah. not like it. it's not like it's, hey, we write your name on it. It's like, wake up, stencil that sucker on there, right? So, so here's what you know on Friday when you're trudging away from hell we can all you want to do is go to sleep in the back of your mind you're like hey this all starts again on monday like how do i figure it out how to be and you're asking yourself these questions like hey can i do it can we do it all these other things and what i realized is when i got done with hell week i'd already kind of become 
acclimated to the process because of football, right? Mm-hmm. Like I had to be ready for the next game. And so I kind of wrote this down. I told him, I said, Hey, just to affirm the fact that I'm not about marginalizing outcomes, here's the process of reloading. And I've actually learned a lot of, a lot of what I say, I've, I've learned from you mm-hmm. and some of your counterparts and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where that fits in. So for me, the deliberate process is review, rest, recover, and revel. Mm. So when I say review, you look at that past effort and you ruthlessly inventory it through three lenses. Um, for me, uh, I, I have another presentation I call the achieving average. And the achieving average is, it's not vilifying talent, it's just putting talent in its place. Like I'm an achieving average, um, I'm, but I'm not an average achiever. It's a, it's a little bit of a play on words. When I say I'm an achieving average, what I mean by that is if you were to aggregate all my skills and abilities, you'd find me to be a, a high C or a low B in just about everything except for looks. I mean, I'm a good looking guy. Like I know that. It's just, it just is what it is. I mean, I've dealt with it for a long time. I, I was, I was walking out of the house this morning and I caught a glimpse of myself in a mirror and I, I turned and I looked at my bride and I said, Hey babe, I can turn it down, but I can't turn it off. It just is what it is. And <laughs> She laughed too, which is a little bit hurtful, man. But I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a talented guy. But what I realized back in eighth grade is the mountain makes all men and women average if you're aiming high enough. Mm. And, and, and talent is real and treasure is real. And that's an advantage. But there's got to be something more than that. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of ties in every competition we have. right? And so as I unpack that, what I realize is um, you need angles and allies and advantages to really do anything significant. Right. And angles are uh, being optimized. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Allies are making sure you're surrounded by people who mean what they say as much as you mean what you say. And advantages are your actual talent. So that first step to reload, which is review, as you look at that last map, whatever that last effort was, and you ruthlessly inventory through the lens of angles. Hey, how can I get better, faster, smarter, stronger, right? I think nature is an amazing teacher for this. I mean, God gives us whiteboards all over the place and we can just learn if we watch a little bit. But apex predators are fascinating, right? And everybody in the athletic world wants to view themselves as an apex predator and an alpha. And this is really some of the things I learned from you and your peers. And I think your era of performance coach had access to data that allowed us to rethink things in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually remember a pretty profound conversation I had with you, even before you went to Florida State, just about some of your concepts on recovery. And I mean, I was taking notes. And um, so when I say angles, here's what I mean. Like a lion looks lazy until it's coming at you. And then you're like, holy smokes, that's kind of good. (laughs) Yeah. You watch Shark Week and you look great white shark, like great white sharks look lazy until they're, they're just lollygagging through the ocean until they ascend into this perfect version of who and what they're supposed to be, right? And so angles are about optimization. Like, here's what apex predators know. Apex predators know two things. One, they're going to have to burst. They're going to have to ascend in this perfect version of who and what they are to either defend their territory or or take their prey, like one of the two. So they know they're going to have to, and they never know when. Because And so because they know they have to, and they never know when, then this constant state of optimization. Like you've never seen anything better at taking a nap than a lion. Like that dang thing looks like it's asleep (laughs) until it's ripping your face off. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you look at all these apex predators and you look at their lives and it's a constant state of optimization, harvesting, holding, resting, all these other things. Um, One of the things, you know, we have a, we have a hostage rescue facility here in the office and and you'll hear, you've heard this for years. And the first time I heard it was in the, in the SEAL teams, but I, I know it's been said by a lot of other people. But, but I just never forget this. Uh, someone yelled at me, we're doing hostage rescue. They're like, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Mm-hmm. And as an, as an athlete, that made a lot of sense to me because w- what it meant was if you give yourself time to learn it well and you become smooth, under pressure, that'll become fast. right? Mm-hmm. And I remember when you were working with track athletes, you, you we, we, I mean, this is over a decade ago, and you asked me, like, my fastest 40 times always felt like my slowest ones because they were my most efficient ones. Yeah, you, like there was, there when was, you're running fast, no, you don't even feel it. That's right. You just slow as smooth and smooth as fast, right? So, so what, what the angles process is, 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 is really going, hey, how can I be 
better, faster, smarter, stronger than I used to. And as, as a guy, like for me, the way I competed was I, my gift was knowing you were faster than me. But, but if you're faster than me, and, but, and I know where you're going, now I'm faster than you. Yeah, like you look at the best linebackers ever, and they're Angles. like, they're rolling to the 100%. point before it even happens, like Ray Lewis and those guys. And you can't tell me yeah. Ray Lewis wasn't slower than he was when he started in the league, but 10 years in, he's better and than better. he was. Yeah. He's better. And I was with Ray. Like Ray's second year was my first year at Baltimore. Mm. And I was watching him become the, I mean, he was very gifty. But I was watching him ascend into the student of the game. Like like Ray, I remember Ray saying this one time, if you don't put a film room in your house, you're not a pro. And, and, and what, what does film give you? It gives you angles. That's what it gives mm-hmm. you, right? So for me, if you're, if you're faster than me, but I know where you're going, I'm faster than you. If you're bigger than me, but I'm lower than you, I'm now stronger than you. And when we look at the angles piece, we're, we're, we're finding mechanical advantage, right? Mm-hmm. So the next year you have allies. And allies are, are, are where you, you, you measure, hey, did everybody else around mean what they say as much as I meant what I said? And, and did I mean what I say as, as much as I thought I did when I started, right? And, and that's kind of how you're constantly reassessing and constantly refining this, this adventure party, like this, this, uh, this, this crew that you're rolling with. Right. Mm-hmm. And the third thing is advantages. And again, I don't mean to vilify talent and treasure. These aren't the enemy. They're just also not everything. They're only one third of the equation. So if you have more talent and treasure, but I have better angles and allies, I'm probably going to win. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's the foundational principle of, of asymmetric warfare and special operations is um, we can be out outgunned, but we're never outmanned because we have a we have a gear and a speed. So <clears throat> so for me, the great thing about talent, when talent meets adversity, really one of three things happens. Um, that talent gets affirmed. Hey, I am as good at this as I thought I was. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is where I think these last 18 months have been really exceptional. Uh, another thing that happens when you meet adversity is talent becomes revealed. Like there's things that you didn't know you can do. And one of the reasons that I think we're going into this great resignation piece is people have overcome the barriers that inhibited their thinking they could adventure well. Like it, like there's, there's virtually everybody is doing what they'd always done differently now. Mm-hmm. Because you did what you, you had to do what you always did and you had to find different ways how to do it. So now there's this, there's this like a uh, green field. There's this unpopulated map of what you could do now that you've discovered these other things that you have the capacity for. Right? Have you found so, anything that you've like discovered? Oh, like anything? this, like this, like speaking to people, I was really nervous about doing keynote presentations and not being in the room um, because uh-huh. I love being in the room with people. Like I love interaction. There's all these subtleties, like when you're speaking. And one of the things I love doing is I love helping veterans and athletes distill what they learn on the ball field and the battlefield into value propositions in the boardroom and, and be able to provision for themselves and their families with their soft skills and experiences, right? And hey, the hard skills are important, um, but a meaningful percentage of your hard skills aren't applicable in the boardroom, but the boardroom is where you are now. Mm-hmm. So how do you mine these hard skills, soft skills and experiences that you got on the ball field on the battlefield and, and provision for yourself and create opportunity on the boardroom. And it's really fun to watch people realize that truthfully at the end of the day, in most circumstances, your soft skills and your experiences is what made you different on the ball field and battlefield anyway. Mm-hmm. Like for me, I would have been so excited when, when I, when I left the military and football, if the Terry Tate office linebacker had been an actual position, <laughs> like I'm, my hard <laughs> skills would have come right from the ball field and battlefield into the boardroom. If there was actually a Terry, Terry Tate office linebacker, right? I'd be <laughs> great. Right. But that's an example of how hard skills don't necessarily transition. Exactly. Um, but I was really nervous because f- for me, and I, I tell guys, like, I, I kind of look at myself as a songwriter that can kind of sing. But when I'm writing presentations, I'm really writing them for somebody else. Like, man, I can't hate, wait to hear Todd, who is a senior listed at a tier one unit, give his version of pursuing elite. And you give them a framework and they drop their skills and experiences down into it. And it's just, it's just amazing. Like, mm. like I love cover albums where someone is singing a song that was written or sung by someone else first and, and it's their version of it, which is really, really powerful. Um, so for me, you know, adversity, uh, it affirms talent, it reveals talent. And the third thing it does is it blows talent up. Like it just, it's just, Hey, I thought I was good as this, but I'm not. But mm-hmm. what it tells you is who is. 
And now you can circle back to that allies and, and, and your and your crews are fine because adversity revealed who had the talent that you thought you did, but you don't. And now Dude, you Clint, adventure again, right? You are a warrior poet. Don't nobody Whoa. be confused by what he said at the beginning. Like every time I am with you, I'm I've been taking, I don't know if you've been seeing me hacking away on my computer here. It's like right below the camera. But I like, saw you're playing solitary. I was no, like, you Tetris. 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 Tetris is too hard. I can't do it. And it's the Russians. That's <laughs> a joke. That's a joke. I'm joking. We're going to take a break for just a moment to talk about how you can get exclusive content designed for living a high performance life. Every week I send out a newsletter called Adaptation. In this newsletter, I provide you with information and resources to improve your health, well being, and performance. I cover topics like sleep, stress, exercise, nutrition, and mental performance. You can sign up today for this free newsletter at www.ericcorum.com. Now, back to the show. Um, man, yeah, like, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep going. Keep going. So, so the first step to reload is review, right? Okay. Hey, looking at that last map and, and kind of pretty ruthlessly inventorying the angles, the allies, and advantages, right? Mm-hmm. The second thing, and this is where I really, I think your profession and your generation of performance professional, performance scientist, like I describe you and, and some of our friends as like performance adventurers, like y'all are, <laughs> like, it's like, it's, it's like y'all are, um, sailors that, that they got the steam engine and yep. I was like, Hey, I, it, cause, because, you know, I, I remember when we were talking about catapult when I first came out Yeah, and you're looking at all these other things and, and Athos, and I mean, just, there's been a data stream, but this. But one of the things I talked to you about over 10 years ago was, so you got to review, then you got to rest. Yeah. And rest, I think, is perhaps the most marginalized element of reloading ever. I mean, the, the, and the investment capital that's being poured into the concept of sleep is stunning, right? You're wearing an order ring, aren't you? Oh, yeah, 100%. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting for me. Uh, I'll... I was in a room with a whole bunch of executives and, and I said, Hey, how many of you view yourselves as competitors? And boom, everybody raise your hand. Right. Mm-hmm. And I go, how many of you treat yourself like athletes? And it was like, and I told everybody's like, Hey, that that's the same. And that's the same way I felt. Right. I would have never gone to practice um, going to bed as late as I did the night before I go to work. I would have never gone to a scrimmage uh, treating the performance system that is me the way I do the night before I, I go to meetings, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a non-sequitur here between how I perform in the boardroom and how I would perform on the ball in the battlefield, mm-hmm. right? And stewarding and recovery was a big part of that, right? And so sleep for me became like, hey, listen, we have to sleep. It's a, it's a, it's a non-negotiable Um it's like our phones, when we shut our phones off, they're like, they're not, they're just doing things that they can only do when we're not messing with them. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's all these millions and billions of functions that our body has to do when we're not messing with it, when we're asleep. Right. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the, and the whole self science thing is kind of fascinating right now, like with this aura, with this Apple watch and, and you're smarter than me. So I don't want to go down the rabbit trail on this, but here's what I've learned me getting eight hours of sleep for a variety of reasons is really tough. Right. Um, and one of the things I've learned is it's, it's for me. And, and so when I didn't get eight hours, I would walk into that next day, like with some self-imposed hurdles and limits because I didn't get eight hours. Right. Okay. Like when mentally. Weren't, yeah. I mean, it was just like a barrier to performance. Yeah. Everybody told you, hey, you got to get eight hours. You can't perform. Yeah. Like, well, I didn't get eight hours. So I guess I'm not performing. Right. There you go. When I started wearing these wearables and stuff, what I realized is, and, and I don't want to, you're the, you're the pro. I'll just tell you my self science. Right. I love this. For me, it's more, it's more important about how much deep sleep and REM sleep I get mm-hmm. than the totality of sleep. So for me, eight, eight hours is a basket that within how, how much of these two really critical notes can I get the deep and RM? And mm-hmm. what I realized is I don't need eight hours of sleep most of the time. I need this amount of deep and this amount of REM sleep. And so it was really exciting for me to go, hey man, you know, because I can fall asleep fast, but once I wake up, I'm up and there's hypervigilance. There's all the stuff that veterans and stuff deal with. But like I just kind of doom myself to never being rested because I couldn't get eight hours of sleep. Now do I'm you mind me asking how that. many hours you do get on average a night? 
so, somewhere somewhere between five and seven. I'll okay. give you between five and seven most nights, right? Do you and, know if there's a duration that you do feel better? Closer to seven? Uh, really, it has to do. If I get over an hour and a half of REM and I get over an hour of deep, like that's that's kind of money for me, right? Really? You wake up and feeling I know there's good. A, there, yeah. Yeah, I really do. And, and I think there's also something to when I wake up. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a big, there's like, and this is where it gets a little bit weird, right? Um, if I wake up between four and five, um, if I wake up between 355 and 445, I'm, I'm money, man. If, if I wake up at 451, it's, it's a train wreck. I feel like, you know, the sun, it's just a weird, and you know, it has to do with sleep cycles and mm-hmm. all this other stuff. Right. Um, so, so some, sometime is w- when I wake up and, but a lot of it has to do with how much deep, how much REM sleep mm-hmm. I got. So to bring back up to the strategic level, like we got to sleep and it's fascinating to try to figure out how your unique machine is made. Mm-hmm. You know, and I tell people like, Hey, performance is really the marriage of three things. It's the body, the brain, and the mind and the body and the brain are fundamentally machines. So they run by machine rules. Right. And your mind has the ability to impose its will on the body and the brain for short periods of time. But when you look at the body and the brain as a performer, as a, as a vehicle, you begin to treat it more effectively, right? And so, mm-hmm. so we got to sleep. So we got to review, and then we got to rest. We got to sleep, and sleep is one where we recalibrate. And then we got to recover. And uh, uh, for me, that's how we recharge. And this again, this is kind of a self science, like know thyself. I've kind of feel like. You got to figure out the song that your body, your brain, your mind, and your soul sing. And these are like asymmetric recharge. It's like a quick charge, right? So and here's what I'll tell you. Like for me, there's this fusion of body, brain, mind, soul. If I jump in my truck and I, and I drive my daughters to nowhere and I just listen to their music, woe the person who has to compete with me once I do that. <laughs> Because man, I'm I, I'm 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 reminded myself why I'm doing everything I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So if I get thirty minutes with one of my daughters and I'm listening to the music they love, and here's the deal, like I hate their music, <laughs> but I, but I love listening to why they love their music, right? Mm-hmm. And it just recharges me. I mean, you've known this as long as I want to be the kind of guy my girls want to marry one day, right? And I want to I want to create amazing careers for I want to win the war on veteran suicide with the power of Taylor Winston and a good day's work. When I get in that truck and I ride with my daughters and I listen to them tell me about their lives through songs, a couple things happen. One, I call my mom and I ask her to forgive me for making her listen to Def Leppard's Pyromaniac, which is an amazing album, by the way. <laughs> One Arm Drunder, the Thumber, Thunder God. But boy, that's just like it recharges me. When I recover that way, it recharges me. It's like the it's like the nitrous button fast and furious. Mm. Because I I know how to remind myself why I started doing the hard stuff. I'll give you another example. Um, uh, Meet Joe Black. Good movie, Brad Pitt, Anthony Hopkins. There's a scene at the very end. Uh, so there's a spoiler. So if you haven't seen it, you know, put it on mute. Um, but there's a scene at the very end where Brad Pitt has kind of revealed himself as, as death. And, and Anthony Hopkins realizes that he's out of this bar time. And they go across this bridge and it's really powerful music. And then Anthony Hopkins turns and looks at Brad Pitt. He goes, should I be scared? Mm. And I choke up when I think about this. Brad Pitt looks at him and goes, "Not a man like you." And like for me, like do things in such a way that it's like the Tecumseh, you know. And when your time comes, you know, sing your death song and go to your. Like for me, like those are those are literal performance hacks, man. When I get discouraged, I get discouraged a lot, and I forget why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm because I'm trying to do things the harder way, man. There's no sh- shortcuts. I let Roger Staub. I think Roger Staub said this first. I want to believe that he said it first. He said there's there's no traffic on the extra mile, right? Mm. I, I find these little processes that revive. I mean, look as an as an athlete, you know, uh, HRV VO2 max. Like from the performance, like that's one of Lance Armstrong's biggest gifts is he had this lung capacity and this this, this genetic predisposition to recovery. And my deal is like, hey, whether it's genetic or not, if it's not genetic, if it is genetic, create a process that complements that, that genetic advantage. If it's not genetic, then come up with a process, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you know, so we have to review, rest, we recover, and then we revel. If, if we recover, if recover is how we individually recharge, revelry is how we communally recharge. Mm-hmm. It's how we 
it's how we remind each other why we started to doing this hard thing. It's, it's sitting around a campfire telling stories. It's laughing at each other. It's laughing at ourselves. I mean, the physiology behind this with dopamine and epinephrine, I mean, it's really fascinating um, stuff. But revelry is like this communal recharge. And, and here's what I learned. And it's what I told this company. I said, hey, the way to be, the difference between being, the way to pursue a lead is to, to find ways to reload rather than to relax. And me- mechanically and methodically, how we reload is this. Like once we get done with the adventure, it's not about marginalizing that. Like we have to celebrate what we just did, right? Um, for a host of just psychological and physiological reasons. Like we, and that's one of the, I think the casualties in, in our culture is we tend to marginalize success mm-hmm. too quickly. I mean, we don't, we don't celebrate and, and, and we think this kind of stoic, uh, recalcitrant kind of like wasn't like th- that's not a good quality really right and so so for me uh what i realized is it worked on the ball field it worked on the battlefield and it works in the boardroom too and it certainly works at the breakfast table because mm. so, so to go back to the, the hell we context right you get done on friday and you're asking yourself man can i keep doing this and how do you know that you reload it well so for me uh, Sunday night, you're getting ready to start SEAL training again, and you're still asking yourself questions. But here's the question. What else can I do that I never thought I could do? Like when you start asking yourself, hey, what else can I do that I never thought I could do before? Now, you know, you've kind of you've kind of reloaded you like you because you can only ask yourself those questions on the other side of doubt and recovery. Right. And so for me, when it comes to pursuing a lead, fundamentally pursuing a lead is, is, is this kind of um, call to action to use your time. When, when, when we buried my father, I, I don't remember a ton about my father's funeral. I remember how many people were there, right? And I remember, I remember looking at my family and I remember kind of remember, I, I once saw my dad in the hospital and I remember, <laughs> It was just he and I, and he said, um, hey, so we got to make some decisions about what you're going to do next. And I, cause I'd started to get recruited for football and, and stuff like that. And, and, uh, he effectively said, you've got to make a 40 year decision and not a four year decision. And he goes, cause I'm fighting and the doctors are trying hard and no one's not in this to win it. But I'll never forget this. He looked at me, he goes, son, leaders talk about what they don't want to talk about. They say what they don't want to say. They hear what they don't want to hear. And they plan for what they don't want to happen. And that's what makes them lead it. So we got to talk about what happens if this didn't work out. And I, that was kind of when the reality of it kind of hit me. I was like, because, you know, you think your father's immortal, you know, and, he, and he's deified. And my dad was a big person, like a big, huge personality, very caring. My, my dad used to tell me there's two kinds of people in the world, but it would change every time. So there's like, 36 kinds of people in the world. <laughs> he was a big guy, so I didn't say anything. To yeah. him. And we were born in Arkansas, so I didn't know. I didn't know if he was right or wrong anyway. And, uh, and he, he goes, there's two kinds of men in the world. There's men that walk in a room and say, here I am. And there's men that walk in a room and say, there you are. And I want you to be a there you are kind of man. And that's who he was, right? And that's who I've tried to be. And he goes, because he didn't need to know someone's been looking for you. So I remember being at his funeral in Little Rock, Arkansas. I remember how many people there. And I remember that there was as much or more laughter than there was tears. Right. And I just could just, I mean, what a way to, uh, well, I mean, that was just my father's life. And, and then, um, one of his dearest friends read, uh, Jack London's credo. I would rather be ashes than dust. Right. And then the, the, the proper function is to live, not merely to exist. I shall not waste my diet days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. And so for me, the desire to pursue elite isn't a, about never being satisfied it's about this desire to use our time and i think when you heap that experience of losing my father with the reality of the world i went into on the battlefield um you know i've lost a lot of friends and 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 more than a lot of men that i think were better than me and i think the worst thing you could ever do is not use the time that your friend no longer has and so for me, when I talk about pursuing the lead, it's that desire to be a steward of their time. And, and, and so just to kind of, so the difference between being an excellent lead is the ability to reload instead of just relax, mm-hmm. not at the expense of 
rest and reflection and revelry and, and, and recovery. Right. But then, you know, going back to that story where my chief was like, Hey, the reward for excellence is no punishment. I'm not here to be excellent I'm here to be elite. There's a difference. I'm not done yet. And that was his phraseology for me. That was such a lightning bolt moment. You know, Mark Twain once said the difference between the right word and the nearly right word is the difference between a lightning bug and a lightning bolt. Right. And, and for me, what happened was when I lost my father, I just, I just kind of found, I was pursuing percentages of these different people. And, and I would, I would just take a percentage of that person's life that I wanted to see in mine. And I pursued that and I aggregated this like, um, uh, cabinet level board of people I wanted to be like, and there's tremendous diversity in, in these people. There were, there were men and there were women and there were business people and there were athletes and there were operators and there were husbands, their wives and there their mothers and their fathers and their aunts and their uncles. And there's this tremendous diversity in the demographic of the people I was trying to pull percentages from. And all of a sudden in that moment, when my chief said that, they all made sense to me. And here's a, this single red thread of continuity that they all had between them was they just weren't done. Like they, 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 they did whatever they did. They got to the X and they hug and they high five and they celebrate and they rest and they recovered and they revel. But they, in their fields of expertise or passions or professions would always find a way to reload. You know, Clint, something so for- you have really hit me hard with here is like, you know, I was, um, you're talking and I'm thinking about burnout. Yeah. Okay. Because as you're pursuing excellence, burnout is something that's really real and it's a real difficult thing. And I think the the way that keep people keep going after that hard thing mm-hmm. is what you said earlier. You know you've you've reloaded. Yep. When you can ask yourself, what else can I do that I never thought I could do? Because that means that physically, psychologically, yeah. you're ready to go again. And I think that and, once and you it puts the hard thing in its place, it yeah. makes the the hard thing isn't the X. Because the hard thing is the X you can get to, and that's all it was. Like, I'm reading Ecclesiastes right now, and Ecclesiastes is all about that. You get to where the world tells you, and you're like, huh, right? <laughs> so the the X may be the hardest thing, but it can't be the highest thing, right? And, and, and so for me, that distinction, um, it, it has a, for me, burnout is bad planning, right? And bad planning is heading for the wrong high ground. And, and I think the restlessness comes from wanting to see what else you and the people you live with are capable of. And when that's, when, when, when that's the, the X is hard, the, the Y is the highest, like that's, that's when I think you become a little more resilient and resistant. Um, and that's when, if you do have burnout, I think it's at the physiological level and you're looking at the, Hey, how do I refuel my body and my brain? But if you're uh, following your plan, a review, rest, recover, and revel. And then you wait till you have that moment. This is what kind of the light bulb moment I just kind of had is like, if you're doing these things, when you get, when you have that feeling of what else can I do, that's mm-hmm. when you know you're ready to go again. It's like that signal. It's, yes. it's, it's, it's like that. Uh, we've all felt this as competitors, right? It's like, you know, as a football player, it's after that first play, right? You know, that first play, you're still nerves, all the stuff. So you get hit or the worst thing you, you know, you miss the tackle that like, if I miss this tackle, we're going to lose the game. And you miss that tackle and you're like, okay, that was a play in a series in the first quarter. So like, it's that settling, right? You just kind of like, Oh, all right, I got this right. So, so for me, so I had to slow down and I had to go, okay, if elite achievers, and this is an important distinction. I'm, 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 so let me, there's a difference between being an elite and elitist. An elitist is always filling themselves up. No matter what happens, it's another cup of them, right? Elites are different. Elites are always pouring themselves out. Like they're almost recklessly generous with their gifts and abilities. And I remember when I was at the Ravens, and I don't know if Ray will remember this, we're in a meeting room and Ray's asking all these other linebackers. In theory, we're all trying to beat Ray out. And this is in 1997. And he's saying, hey, what are you seeing? And he's telling these people how to get better. And I thought it was really amazing. And I'd come from the Naval Academy. So we just kind of had that next man up mentality by, by doctrine and definition and demonstration. And uh, he got to me and I said, hey, Ray, why are you telling everybody your secrets? And he looked at me and he smiled and he goes, Clint, everybody gets the ring or nobody gets the ring. Mm-hmm. And then he smiled at me and he goes, and I'm not scared. And so those two awarenesses, one, I'm doing something so hard that I need 10 other people to be able to do it with me. 
And two, fear is the only reason you don't tell everybody the secret. You know, uh, it was just really profound to me, right? Yeah. So that's the difference between an elite and an elitist. So as I sat back there and I said, hey, so if uh, elites are not done yet, what are they not done doing? And this is where it kind of came to the pursuit points and, and what, I, what I saw, what I've seen and then and what I've kind of affirmed now is on the ball field, the battlefield, the boredom and the breakfast table, the people that consistently produce elite outcomes, they have these kind of pretty consistent qualities that they're balanced, they're curious, they're tribal, they're intentional, and they're authentic. And these aren't linear or sequential. They are um, like five lanes on the interstate to where you say you want to go. Um, but for me, balance is not an equal distribution and effort. Balance is having high ground for hard days, like deliberately pre-investing in, in faith and family and friends that you know, because here's what you know, you know you're going to need them and you never know when. Like just like that line on the plate, like I know I'm going to need a burst, I'm never going to win. So we got we to gotta be deliberate, intentional about investing in those things that are going to remind us who we are and what we're about when stuff gets hard. And like for me, this is where I kind of stole that, uh, this kind of simple system of decision, design, and discipline. So I look at something, I got to make a decision. And the design is how I act on that decision. And discipline is how I remember my decisions and my designs when stuff gets hard. And it's always hard, right? So I, I took that 10,000 our 10,000 repetitions thing, which I think is great. I think the 10,000 repetitions thing is great. The problem I have with it is, at least in my life, I only apply it to my passions and my professions. So what I have is I had these amazing passions and professions, but the rest of my life was struggling. And here's why. Because you measure what matters. Mm -hmm. And you count what counts. And so I could tell you I made more than 10,000 tackles as a linebacker, practice game visualizing. As a CEO, I made more than 10,000 shots. You know, as a business person, I made more than 10,000 hard decisions. As a husband, I've been married, I've been married 24 years. I've done 10,000 things and only husband does. And I, I could not answer that with the confidence and certainty that I could the other things, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a problem because you measure what matters. So I went to my bride and I said, hey, babe, uh, I, 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 was, I was speaking to an NFL team and the, the guy, you'd know his name. He said, hey, how do I make sure I'm as good a father as I am a tight end? And I said, uh, well, what are the reps? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, there's a supply chain to executing under pressure as a tight end. And being a father is the same thing. And once we know the reps, then we can mass 10,000 repetitions in those things. And then we can perform our pressure. So what are the reps? And it's one of the times that I'm, you've probably done this too, where you're answering a question and you feel a little bit hypocritical because you're yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not doing this either, right? Like, this is really good, Clint. How about you do that? You know, yeah. and, uh, but I remember going home, I was, I was flying home and I was writing these, these five things that, um, and I'm big on, I don't have a list of more than five because this has got to do this. You got to keep this hand free to do that. Right? <laughs> so here's five things to let my bride know. I love her. And I went to my bride and said, Hey babe, um, I don't know if I'm an elite husband, but I want to be somebody do 10,000 things an elite husband does. I said, I don't know if I've done 10,000 things an elite husband does. And she said, you haven't. I'm like, hold on. I wasn't asking you. I was, I was saying perhaps maybe, right. <laughs> and, and I said, but here's, but here's five things that let you know. But what a lead husband do? I like take you on a trip once every quarter, get you flowers, and and she once she loved that. She loved that I was being intentional about becoming a husband that I want that she that she deserved and I wanted to be. And she kind of raised her hand. She goes, "These are for me." And I said, "Yeah." She goes, "Can I tell you what they should be?" I'm like, "That makes a lot of sense." And she goes, "Listen, I'd love to go on a three day trip, but just can you not be a jackass when you come home from work sometimes?" I'm like, "Don't." Be yeah, as which I told you that, and, and she gave me these five really kind of achievable things, right? Yeah. And then I went to my daughters, and I went to all my daughters. I said, "I'm going to be an elite daddy. Here's what I'm going to do." And the redhead goes ten thousand, and I go, "Yeah, but she goes, well, minus five, wrong American girl doll." I'm like you can't, you don't take away points. You just add, right? <laughs> yeah. But but here's here's what's so important. Like they know they matter because I'm measuring. I have an app on my phone with counters. I'm literally, I take reps and I, and I ask them what matters to them. And, and I can look at my counter and go, I'm bet I'm going to get an argument with Amy. I'm behind or, or post argument. I can look at it and go, oh, that's why, because I haven't been doing the work. Right. <clears throat> and here's why balance, you know, having high ground for hard days is so important because man, I have, I have so many hard days, but no bad ones. I mean, they're swinging to having a high, uh, hard day and a bad day is high ground. Mm -hmm. Having faith and family and friends that can remind you who you are and what you're about and why you started doing the hard stuff. And then we talk about curiosity. So the, the, I call these the pursuit points and, and balance. 
the balance curiosity, tribalism, intentionalism, authenticity. And, and curiosity for me, I, I tell everybody that the pursuit points aren't linear or sequential, but um, if you had to pick one that's a catalyst to all others, it's curiosity. Because curiosity is is literally putting your words to work. I tell my daughters, like, hey, girls, it's words, work, and wins. And um, serendipity has more to do with success than most people think, but you got to put your words to work to even win. And for me, curiosity is a declaration of I'm not done yet. I mean, it's just evidence. And, and for, for me, when you see curious people, I also equate curiosity to courage. Curiosity is um, intellectual courage. And it's the co-equal and precursor to physical courage. And I'm not diminishing physical courage when I say that. I'm just being honest. The truth about physical courage is you're brave because you had to be. Mm-hmm. And what elevates curiosity to the terrain of courage is all you have to do is not do this. And no one will know that you didn't know. Mm. I mean, I'm a 47 year old man. Like, I'm, I'm somewhat accomplished. And to this day, when I'm a room full of people that I respect and I admire, like I'm not in the pit of my stomach when I have a question because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the answer. I'm afraid of the work that comes with the answer. I'm afraid of uh, admitting I don't know. I'm afraid of what you think about me and I don't know. Well, I think throughout all humanity, that's the definition of courage is action on the face of fear. So, so by definition, when you see people raising their hand, you know you're in the presence of courage, right? But, cur- but curiosity is a, it's a creator, it's a catalyst, and it's a complacency killer, right? And, and so, you know, elites are balanced, elites are curious, elites are tribal. For me, if you look at the history of tribalism, tribes affiliate and defy historic gathering boundaries uh, for success or survival. So it's, it's, it's this meritocracy of affiliation, right? But when you see people groups, you can call them one of four things. They are gaggles, groups, teams, and tribes. Mm-hmm. And what makes these things different is what pulls them together. Like a gaggle is united by problems. We got the same problem. We made the wrong, same wrong choice, wrong place, wrong time, right? Groups are united by preference. They like the same stuff. Teams are united by purpose. You have a common goal and you need to, you recognize the need for diverse skills. You align for the pursuit of that goal. But sometimes that's all you do. I mean, there's 32 teams in the NFL. They all say the same stuff in August. In January, you figure out who meant it, right? Mm-hmm. Because if, when adversity hits purpose, uh, one or two things is going to happen. It's either going to, that, 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 that opinion is going to rise to a conviction or it's going to degrade to a, attrition. So, you no, know, T.E. Lawrence once said, an opinion can be argued with, but a conviction is best shot because conviction produces action, right? Mm-hmm. And so in the NFL, you have 53 guys that say at the beginning of the season, hey, we shared this purpose and then adversity hits. And, and it becomes a conviction for 53 men or a dozen. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, you're, you're done in December. You know, have a great Christmas, right? And, you know, one of the other questions I get all the time is like, hey, Clint, how do you get everybody in the boat? And I'm like, you don't. You can't get everybody in the boat. It's free will. Everybody's got a choice, right? What you can do is you can pull someone's opinion that this is their purpose to their conviction, right? And in, in, in my mind, this is like a, you know, in Europe, they have these amazing tug of war leagues, like literal leagues, right? And for me, pulling someone's opinion towards, and this is the function of a leader, you pull someone's opinion towards a conviction with like this performance, process, passion, purpose. So it's like performance, step, pull. Like, hey, how good are you doing at what you do that's going to inspire me to do what I do. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody, sometimes people, sometimes people hear what you say, they always hear what you do. Right. And then, and then the second step pulls passion and, and passion is cool because passion is, you know, when passion is present, it defies description other than that. Right. Like you look at the Chicago bears and you could say Gail Sayers and Dick Buckus were both passionate, but how that passion manifested itself is very different. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, you'll get Ray and Ed Reed, but you can't be both incredibly passionate, but how that passion manifests themselves. I mean, there's just different. So passion can be different. It's just got to be there. Right. Mm. And then you have process and process is how, listen, if you know you're doing something that's too hard for any one person to do on their own process is how you weave those collective strengths into each other. That's how, you know, when to roll in and when to roll out. Right. Um, when I talk about the personalities in a tribe, I say there's four personalities. There's casualty. The person who can or won't do what it takes to stay on the tribe. Then there's contributors, competitors, and adventurers. And contributors push down. They set the foundation, right? Competitors push out. They're creating distance between you and the enemy and the adversary. And adventurers push up. Mm-hmm. Adventurers are obsessed with, hey, how good can I be? How good can I make others? And can I change the way this thing's even played? 
but it gets a little different than that. And the reality is, is throughout any endeavor that requires more people than just one, we rotate through those positions. So sometimes you're the adventure, sometimes you're the contributor, sometimes you're the competitor. Um, you look at, you know, big wave surfing, like Laird Hamilton's not always on the wave. Like when he is, he's the adventure. Right. Sometimes he's on the back of the jet ski spot and now he's the contributor. And somebody's on a jet ski drive and now he's the competitor, right? Mm. And process is how you define who's the adventure, who's the contributor, who's the competitor throughout the endeavor of a, of a goal. And then you have purpose. You got to have that shared purpose, right? So tri tribes, the way I, I, I say this, I say, you know, tribes flow, teams row. Right. Like there's a fluidity to how tribes move. Like there's a, you move at the speed of trust as a tribe, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and trust can manifest itself in performance speed. So at least are tribal. These are balanced or curious. They're tribal. At least are intentional. They always know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, they, they know how to reconcile the what's against the why. Like a, what I have to do is wake up zero four thirty every morning. Um, if you don't have a why to reconcile that against it's, problematic right mm -hmm. but when you know why you're doing what you're doing the what stays small it's like the, that that eclipsing factor right like the so 250 plus started my class only 12 of us made it and how did only 12 of us made it well you know they're amazing guys that got hurt i mean it's, it's a hard training right so a percentage got hurt another percentage just recognized this wasn't for them another percentage just couldn't do the job right so it's not as though like 12 of us were the best. I mean, you know, entropy, chaos theory, injury, those things happen, right? But the one thing 12 of us did have in common is we never got why we started in the first place. So it didn't really matter what we had to do that day, right? You know, so like, you know, I'm not a runner, but you run a lot. And I don't like running. Hmm. Fundamentally, I have issues with it. I think marathons, the Battle of Marathon, the Greeks won. Fidipides ran 26 miles, said he won, then he died. I don't think we need all that kind of behavior. <laughs> 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 but, but I had to figure out it, it, for your listeners, like here, here's the deal. If you got to run and you're a big person, here's the secret to big man running. Lean forward until you're about to fall over, then don't. For however <laughs> just you use get. your momentum. Yeah, it's just a controlled fall. Like yeah. you don't look cool, but you make the times, right? Mm. And so elites find way, always find ways to never forget why they started doing the hard stuff. And 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 for me, I, I think there's kind of two whys. There's a high why and a big why. And your high why is inherently personal, right? It doesn't have to be the same as everybody else's. Um, it's what they say about you when you're gone. And the stats on death are pretty convincing. Um, and your big why is why you do what you do, right? And all of life is about making decisions. And all of competition is about making better decisions faster than our competition. And if we don't know why we're doing something, we're not going to make good decisions. And we're sure not going to make fast ones. Mm. So my high why, you've heard me say this for years, I want to be the kind of man my girls want to marry one day. Who I am, what I do, who I do it for. My girls come with a man like me. I better be okay with it because that's what I showed. Them. And that man is going to be purposeful, passionate, protective, and a provider. I mean, it's not those four things. I'm not going to have to scare them off because my girls aren't going to want them. Right? Mm. And my big why? I want to work for the best leaders in America and create amazing careers for veterans and their families as they come all the way home. Like I know why I do everything I do that day. And if I forget, it's very easy to remember. And the what stays small when you have that that intentional is in that kind of why. And the last pursuit point is this, is elites are authentic. They preach from their pain and they share their scars. And they do it for both moral and tactical reasons. Tactically, you do it because the one absolute in humanity is time. It's the only thing we've ever agreed on, 24-7, 365. I haven't agreed on anything since then. And if we look at mistakes as increments of time, we begin to understand the significance of mistakes. Time is irrecoverable, right? And Jeff Bezos is the wealthiest man on the planet. And his business proposition basically says you can't buy time. You can only save it. Right. Mm. And every football game you've been on the sidelines for and played in and same for me, 60 seconds, 60 minutes. We all got it. Me and Notre Dame have 60 minutes. You know, army, me and army goes and the, and the clock doesn't care about either one of us. Right. And if I make a two or three second mistake and I don't tell anybody about it, I've doomed 10 other people to, to repeat or exceed that mistake. And so now I've lost time. Right. Mm -hmm. And in, in, Authenticity allows you to harvest the finite resource that you and the enemy have the same amount of, right? So it's, you know, it's tactically right to be authentic, but it's also morally right. It's redemptive. Like when I, when I see a young man about to make a mistake that I make, I, and, I, and I say, hey, man, August, you know, 9, 2004, I did this. It's not going to bless you. Don't do it, man. 
I don't get that time back. I don't recover it, um, but I do redeem it. And you know, redemption matters, right? Mm-hmm. And so for me, that kind of whole concept of pursuing a lead is like, hey, how, how, how am I, how am I, you know, picking the right X's to adventure towards? And like the way I look at maps is like, there's no X on a map you're going to get to it. Everything's perfect for me. There's X's on a map worth adventuring towards and people worth adventuring with. And you bounce around towards Jesus till you meet him. Hmm. And, and, and when you kind of shed that burden of perfection or the world satisfying you, then it's just about the adventure, man. Like I was, I was just listening to Huberman talk about something and, you know, when, when you look at the body brain kind of fusion, um, putting the X in its right place and making it the hardest, but not the highest that allows you to, I get excited about the next adventure. I want to win, but I love playing. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when you put those things in the right place, and then when you have these maps, like, you know, you and I know a million people and anybody listening to this, if you have tremendous boardroom success at the exhaustion of the ball field, like just, it was mentally and physically damaging for you to pursue that success or at the, at the uh, expense of the breakfast table, that success is unsustainable and largely unwanted. So for me, I look at these four maps as like, like a scrum, like, you know, you just kind of keep them in parallel to each other. And, and you have success I, and you're moving it down. Yeah, and hundred percent. Like, how do I make sure like, you know, am I, am I, am I, is, is my boardroom yoked well to my breakfast table? Because giving yourself a high five just looks dumb. Like no one, you don't look cool. You know, you don't look cool. So you gotta have someone you gotta high five when you're done. Right? And so for me, the pursuing the lead is, is not just about, it's less about getting somewhere and more about the right way to get anywhere worthwhile. Hmm. If that makes sense. Clint, you just put on a master class. This is going to be listened to a lot. No, no. Excited, man. I'm I'm passionate. And for me, I have never, besides you speaking on a stage, this was like, I I have a page and a half of notes. I felt bad. I was like, I'm typing. I'm like, no, you type really well. I just like you. you, It's the Apple. Apple. When when you, it's really nimble, but. No, I look at these, look at these myths. Those man. are, I, those I, are some I, big... I hit tangential keys all the time. Like, it's like, <laughs> this is my, my, this is an area weapon. I hit the J and the I, and some, I had a P the other day. I don't, I don't know how that happened, but, um, thank goodness but, yeah, for I mean, Grammarly. It, I'm telling you. And one of the things, Eric, this is why I love being on is like, you've informed that adventure. I mean, there's things I've learned from you, especially as it relates to the body and the b- b- brain as a performance vehicle. Like my, my daughter, I'm amazing daughters. Um, you know, I was telling her, we were talking about this. I said, Hey, listen, um, you know, trauma is a fascinating thing. I said, um, w- when you look, the way I try to look at myself is my body is the car. My brain is the steering wheel and I'm the driver and autopilot is always designed to survive. Mm-hmm. And I said, and, and either the body and the brain are kind of binary. Everything's great or we're all going to die. Like there's no, the amygdala doesn't know the difference. It's mm-hmm. like, so if you're watching a horror movie and, and, and your mind isn't engaged, then your body and your brain are going to think Jason's really chasing you, which yeah. sucks. right? <laughs> yeah. So your mind is what adds that context and you know, the prefrontal cortex, all that stuff. Right. I said, um, when you learn to kind of treat your body and your brain, like the machine that it is, then you, give your mind more of an ability to oppose its will because all your performance levels are, you know, at a, at a, at a workable level. So, it's, I mean, I've learned a lot of that from you and, 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 and the guys you and I know in common. And um, so I'm very fortunate to have this kind of desire to not be done yet. I mean, that was just kind Dude, of, you're just getting started. Clint, you are just getting started. And I want to, um, I want to wrap this up by, asking you like like i've seen you speak when i was at florida state you came every year i was there and then you and i would bump into each other at different places in time Mm -hmm. and you are one of the best speakers i've ever heard and i'm not just saying that because thank you you're my friend or because you're on the show but you literally are like you can move a group of people and it's because it's very authentic and uh that i mean like if if you just listen to this you know why where can people find you 
if they want to bring you into their organization virtually or in yeah. person? So, so if you go to uh, get dash high ground.com. Mm-hmm. So for me, what I love doing now is building these multidisciplinary facilities, allow veterans and athletes to come home and rebuild their hometown. And we call these kind of co-working sites, the high ground. Right. And mm-hmm. I tell guys like, Hey, you don't miss the battlefield. I mean, you do, you miss pieces of the battlefield. What you really miss is being on the high ground and, and the high ground is hard to get to and harder to stay at. So when you're at the high ground, you're going to be around other people that get even get you in a way that you don't even know how. So get dash high ground.com describes that effort. And then LinkedIn's probably the best way. It's the only social media. I understand. I told my daughter, my Insta face wasn't working the other day. <laughs> like, my Insta face isn't working. She, give me your phone. Like my Snapgram's dumb. <laughs> and, um, and then you can go to holdfasthq.com. But all those kind of all those roads lead to the same thing. And and for me speaking, I, I tell people like speaking, if you talk about what you know and you talk about what you love and you talk to people you're like, it's gonna be all right. Right. I mean, and I and I just advantage myself. I don't I don't talk about things I'm not passionate for. I don't talk about things I don't feel qualified to speak to. And I like people and I enjoy being around people. So I it's it's less gifting and more advantaging really at the end of the day. Mm. Well, Clint, you are, you are, I, I want to say an American treasure. Like you are just one of the most unique and humble. Forrest Gumpian. I'm more Forrest <laughs> Gumpian than anybody else. I just, I just kind of put my head down and I try hard and I'm like, I'm at the Naval Academy. This place is really hard. And, uh, I'm married and she's hot. Don't mess this up. Right? Dude, so, I saw some pictures lucky. of you back in the day. I finally got to see Clint, and what he looks like without a beard. And, yeah, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, I lived in Arkansas for a little while, wonderful place. And I kind of got is. a little bit more perspective. It was a whole row of clips. I was like, dang, man. <laughs> Clint, now, now I see, you know, like I saw him without the beard. And now I'm looking at you and I'm seeing this, you know, we're both in our 40s now, man. Things are changing. Yeah. But every time I talk to you, one thing, you know, we may lose speed, we may lose strength, but God, willing we gain wisdom oh yeah if we're learning that's angles angles and allies and advantages man if you take notes you're going to do it better next time than you did that last time well every time i talk to you i feel like i'm wiser and this is going to be a reoccurring theme having you back on this show but thank you so much for making time today and uh we'll put it in the show notes get dash get dash highground.com we'll put your linkedin in there and then hold fast HQ. And if you get the newsletter adaptation, all that information yeah. was being there. You are a fool if you run a team and you haven't had Clint come in and speak because and you can just go on YouTube and see what he does. And you just heard this. It was fantastic. Uh, so thank you, Clint, for coming on today. Thanks for being my friend, bud. Thanks for helping me uh, uh, be undone. I love repurposing words. Like I am undone. And normally when people say that, that's a negative. But for me, it's just a shorter way to say I'm not done yet. I am undone. I'm with you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, then you may want to check out episode number one with Brian Decker. Brian is the former commander of Special Forces Selection and Assessment and is currently the director of team development for the Indianapolis Colts. In this episode, we discuss talent identification and developing high performance teams. Finally, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app as this is the number one way to help us grow the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. I'll see you soon.